Thanks. Everything's good. Good. Me too. Good. So it being 630, I'd like to open this um, meeting the uh, Board of Health. Uh, it's a joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen also present. Um, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general laws chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting with the Westboro Board of Health will be conducted by a remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and, and the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and a requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the Town of Westboro's website at town.westboro.ma.us. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to watch the meeting may do so via Westboro TV. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the Town of Westboro's website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. So I think we are still waiting a few more minutes for um, Dr. Ehrlich to show up. Oh, actually, it looks yeah, like- I'm on. Yes, here. Excellent. Good. Um, so I think the um, Board of Selectmen have one item that they'd like to um, get done today. And I think I have a couple of items that I'd like to um, talk about. I don't know if Alan, if you or Syed also have additional items you, you want to mention? Uh, no, I assume that we'll we're, we're going to cover the main thing. As long as it's about COVID-19, it's on my agenda. Okay. Good. Um, so is everyone from the Board of Selectmen here? Do you want to take care of your business first or do you want to do it at the end? Sure. Um, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll uh, take it. It's, um, I think it's positive news and we because of uh, some recent legislation passed on the state side has allowed us the ability to um, defer um, payments uh, for folks in terms of um, upcoming uh, tax payments and also to um, waive uh, late fees uh, through that. So um, Shelby, do you wanna uh, uh, give us the motion? I'd be happy to, thank you. I move pursuant to chapter 53 of the acts of 2020, excuse me, 2020 entitled an act to address challenges faced by municipalities and state authorities resulting from COVID-19. The board of selectmen vote the following actions. One, move the date real estate and personal property taxes are due from May 1 to June 1, 2020. Two, Move the date applications for property exemptions are due from April 1 to June 1, 2020. Three, waive the payment of interest and other penalty in the event of late payment of any excise tax betterment assessment or apportionment, water rate, annual sewer use, or other uh, charge added to a tax for any payments with due date on or after March 10, 2020. This waiver will only be given if payment is made after its due date, but before June 30, 2020. I second that. Okay, so seconded by Selectman Emery. Um, discussion on the Board of Selectmen's place, uh, Board of Selectmen's part in terms of this motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's Sayed Hashmi from the Board of Selectmen. Yep. So this is wonderful. Uh, how, do, how are we gonna communicate this to the town, Christy? Um, we are actually required, um, we, we got some guidance from DOR and we're required to put it in certain places. So it's actually going to go, it has to go in a prominent place on our website. Um, it has to go on an official social media uh, page. So we'll put it out through our Facebook. Um, and in addition to that, uh, they have suggested that it be put out uh, through Code Red. And so we will use that as well. Oh, so we can use Code Red to get this out. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. And the second question, I guess, is... Um, I guess at some point, will we have an estimate of, if, of how much this may impact our budget? Yeah, so at your meeting on Tuesday night, um, we will we'll talk about budget impacts. Um, we don't have specific numbers for how it might, how this these waivers um, would impact. Um, you know, certainly, I think it's important to understand that, that you're waiving uh, the fees and penalties um, for late payments only made till June 30. If someone were to make them make those payments on July 1st, 
um, we would have to go back and um, apply all of that interest that, because it's deferred interest. Um, and so I think that's important here. And so, and so to clarify, the town will get all of the taxes and fees and payments due, right. just not penalty and interest if those payments are late, provided they're made by June 30th. Right. So yeah. We're not losing any expected revenue, we're just losing any revenue we would have because of penalties and interest. Right. Correct. And it's really only those that, um, any, only those payments that were due post March 10th, 2020, right. for kind of the beginning of the state of emergency. And yeah, what, what it's doing is what we're trying to do here and what the state's allowing us to do is defer payments and defer penalties. So that's really um, what we're doing here by pushing things that we can to June 1st. And again, we're doing the, the most that we can do based on state law. And this is this this state law was necessary because even if we want to do this as a board prior to this coming into place, we didn't have the authority to do that based on state law. So this, this allows us to do it. And what we're doing is taking advantage of um, all that they provided to us through this special legislation. In, in terms of impact to, to the fiscal year, this the penalties and fees is, is a really small piece of um, I, you know, revenue loss when we look at you know, all the other potential revenue loss that we'll be facing, hotel, motel, meals tax, uh, interest on earnings, so. Uh, one suggestion, uh, there's a lot of information in the motion, um, perhaps, um, and I'm happy to take the lead on this, um, working with Westboro TV, we have a PSA that is scrolling to announce this. Um, so we have a template that we have to use and it has to be vetted by town council. So when we, want to <laughs> that, we can give that to um, Karen. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Christy. You know, and one of the things, Shelby, is even though we're making this vote tonight, we wanted to do this as soon as possible since we had the meeting and we have it uh, posted on the agenda that we can do that. We're doing it by ask Christy that we also will bring this up as a discussion point at next week's regularly scheduled board of selectmen meeting. Again, just to continue to get it out yep. to folks and um, to, to selectman Hashmi's question as well. To, we'll. We'll try to get this out as we have been doing across any and all platforms that are available. So make sure that we reach um, as many people as possible. Great. Thank you, Christy, for being so on top of that. Yeah, and thank you to our legislators for uh, supporting it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions on this? If not, okay, I'll take a roll call vote and uh, let's start with uh, Selectman Edinburgh. Edinburgh, yes. Selectman Hashmi. Uh, yes. Selectman Emery. Yes. Selectman Marshall? Yes. Selectman Johnson, yes. So it's five to zero um, for your roll call vote. And uh, Dr. Walsh, back to you. That was the action we needed to take. Thank you. So on my list, I wanted to kind of get um, Steve to um, review the, the numbers. We uh, present a report to um, the Board of Selectmen on um, Tuesdays and Fridays. And um, then also um, the other three main items that I had were um, to talk about um, construction in town, to talk about um, any new action that we may want to consider regarding parks. And um, while I'm not sure that we'll take any action on it, um, anything that might relate to our curfew that I know some um, cities or towns have done. So on the, the first item, I think, uh, Steve, if you want to take off with the um, kind of the numbers from for this sure. Week. sure, so I can do that. So I'm sure you've all seen the report from Tuesday that I submitted. I'm happy to say, uh, although I'm a little bit hesitant, that we had no new cases today, so it was a good day. Um, but um, as of Tuesday, we had 16 new cases, um, and which brought our total con confirmed and presumed up to 41. Uh, you know, people are coming on, they're going off. Uh, uh, many of those new cases were part of our long-term care facilities in town. Uh, if you've been paying attention to the governor, he has a, a, a pretty strong task force out there right now. The National Guard is going around there testing long-term care facilities. Uh, that's a real, uh, like a bullseye uh, that he has to do. Uh, and that's where the, the majority of the new cases came from. Um, as far as um, right now, we're still pretty much 50-50, female and male. It's Pretty much 50 50 the age group is is spread out but you know a lot of the newer cases are in the uh above 70 year old uh, age range and uh, uh you know uh, many have been recovered there's a bunch at home there's a bunch that have recovered 
Um, and, uh, you know, I can, I can answer questions if you want. I have a quick question. Yep. So the National Guard has already done hours in Westboro? They have, and I think they're coming back. Um, you know, some of the, sometimes when the, the information I got, so I got information Saturday that they were coming, but then I found out they had already been here on Thursday. So uh, sometimes the information that gets to me is a little slow. Uh, so I, I, be, I believe they might be coming back to do uh, a couple of tests here and there also. It's, it's very fluidly. So uh, just because, you know, just because someone tests negative today does not mean they won't be positive tomorrow. So, uh, you know, this thing's in motion, and, and I think they're available to come back as needed. Mm -hmm. So do they test the staff as well as the patients? I'm not sure about the staff. I think I, I know for the patients for sure. I don't know the answer to that, Lee. Um, Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, it's I okay. do know that the, uh, the state does prioritize testing of both um, healthcare workers that are working in long-term care facilities as well as the people in the, the healthcare facilities themselves. Um, whether they got tested or not, I, I, I don't have access to who was tested, but um, I can tell you that they're both on the priority list for people to be tested. Uh, I can also tell you from my own experience that if uh, someone in a long-term care facility has come in contact with someone who is positive for COVID-19, they get sent for testing. I am anecdotally aware of people that were tested that worked at a local facility. Good. And do we know, do we know if our, um, our, our local facilities, and, and I probably should know this, and I apologize, but are they shut down from um, outside visitors at this point or? Yeah, so they, they could all be shut down from outside visitors. Um, I, I think that there's still obviously healthcare workers going in and out. And I think that sometimes they might be moving some patients around. Yeah. And the healthcare workers are screened on a daily basis before they enter the facility. So, you know, they have to take temperatures, they fill out a screening form as far as any symptoms, that sort of thing. So um, the places are pretty much on lockdown for the most part. And that includes healthcare workers that are uh, visiting as well, not just theirs, visiting that are hired by uh, families or the facility as contract workers. Thank you. Good. So, if the, um, Syed or um, Alan, do you have anything about the numbers, or shall we move on? Uh, I just wanted to share a couple of things about the numbers. There, um, one, it was just really interesting. There was a uh, again, this is not um, peer-reviewed scientific uh, literature, and so uh, you know you need to take it for with a huge grain of salt, um, lots of salt. But there was an analysis done by UT Texas, which was kind of very interesting that looked at the probability of community transmission across counties, depending on the number of cases in the county. So for instance, if you had a zero case, the probability of community transmission was considered 9%, even though supposedly you had no cases. And if you had 10 cases, the probability of community transmission was considered 95%. Uh, if you had 20 cases in a county, it was 99%. So I think these numbers that we're getting, I think we need, again, with a lot of caveats that, granted, this has not been peer reviewed, but it kind of goes with the nature of the epidemic that there is a significant community transmission that we all need to, um, certainly our residents need to be concerned about in case anybody is watching. Yeah, so just to, to build on that, I mean, I think that, you know, we don't have, you know, one or 10 or 20 cases in, in, in Worcester County. We have, you know, over a thousand cases. Um, that's it. There's, uh, you know, so the transmission is, you know, 100% at this point. Yeah, so we, no, we, we're not, I mean, there, are, it, there was a point in time where all of our cases were people that, you know, were coming into Worcester County. At this point, most of our new cases are just spread within the county. And so, yeah, proper, you know, hygiene and, and masks and, and the other things that, um, you know, the state is um, advising us and the, you know, federal government is advising us is all very important for people to do. Um, and that, that does help. I would just caution, <clears throat> when you say the um, risk of transmission is 100% or the probability or whatever on this model, I think that uh, is not something that, you know, is easily interpretable in terms of what does that mean for an average person. So if you want to convey the sense that community transmission is certainly going on, yes, that's 100%. But again, 
it doesn't mean that 100 percent of people are going to get this i just, no, agree. just the way you I, phrase that i want to be clear about that. clarification you're, you're absolutely right yeah. you're, you're 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 correct and the other thing i just wanted to just kind of uh um uh briefly discuss is um um and this may be something that Christy may want to discuss is one of the concerns that I have or that is being discussed anecdotally anecdotally in the critical care community is the fact that, you know, that um, there's something called, you know, the, that when you do a breathing treatment, that there's aerosolized um, a virus can be potentially aerosolized. So I'm just wondering when our EMTs are trans, trans, um, transporting people with asthma attacks and they're giving them nebulizers or whatever, or uh, breathing treatments. Do you know if they're wearing the N95 masks when they're uh, transporting them or not? I assume they are, but I just I, thought I'd ask. I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so we, we did give uh, e the EMTs about 395 masks. I know they are using them. Um, and they also got surgical masks. So, uh, you know, if, if the uh, person they're picking up uh, has respiratory problems, they're putting a surgical mask on them. Now, as far as if they need to use breathers, things like that, um, you know, obviously that doesn't work, but uh, they are using personal protective equipment. Uh, they screen people, you know, when the call comes in, as far as whether they uh, need to use that uh, protective gear before they get there. And, uh, you yeah, know, they are using it, Sayed. Uh, let me just jump on that one also. So if they have any respiratory complaints whatsoever, they should be using personal protective equipment. Uh, regardless of how that person is being treated. Uh, and secondly, at least where I work, uh, we are using nebulizers as truly a last resort and someone having an asthma attack is encouraged to just keep using their pocket inhaler, which studies have shown generally works just as well. You may have to take more puffs than usual, but uh, it is just as effective as using one of those nebulizers for the very reasons that you say, state, Syed, uh, the nebulizers do spew the virus all over the place. All right, and then just Nathan, um, do I have permission just to keep uh, just another couple of things? Just while yeah, you can make another comment if you want. All right. So the other uh, other question that I had is because all of us are on the call and we have all different reaches, is that this is a, a very symbolic um, week for many in our community. Passover starts, I believe, tomorrow. And then Easter is, I believe, this Sunday. And correct me if I'm wrong, are, does, do we know that will the stay-at-home orders be um, kept in our community during this time? For so, yeah, uh, stay-at-home stay order or um, advisories uh, for the state are still in effect, even if it's Passover or Easter. Um, people should continue to isolate themselves. Um, I think that the restriction on gatherings larger than uh, 10 people is still in place. And so you cannot gather. Um, I personally would recommend that people are not joining other families to, um, you know, eat meals and that sort of thing. I, I think that that, that only makes sense in this, this uh, time. I don't, I don't believe any of the religious institutions go ahead. are, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Ehrlich. Um, no, go ahead. I don't believe any of the religious institutions are, holding services either if that's where you were going. Um, that's, I was going to say that precisely. So, yeah. And, um, you know, there are many traditions and obviously getting together is one, but, you know, it's okay to, uh, you know, if you bake a pie for someone and leave it on their doorstep, that, you know, if you practice social distancing, you know, food, food is not how we're uh, transmitting these infections. So. Okay. And then the other uh, question that I, um, I guess the other um, much more um, painful discussion I had, and actually I was thinking of Selectman Marshall a long time back. You know, one of the problems with this pandemic is that it's highlighted the fact that, you know, um, end of life, uh, the resources for end of life care, critical care are exceedingly limited. And uh, some people, and it's, you know, they, these are very uncomfortable uh, discussions to have about whether to, you know, especially now when there's a limited number of ventilators, difficult discussions to have about what kind of end of life care you want. And I remember at some point, Selectman Marshall had uh, mentioned that she had, and Shelby, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. This I just thought about it last minute. That there was, there were, I, I don't know if we as a town or whether we working through community groups. I know we have a group of people working in a task force, which 
uh, Shelby is involved with, whether we want to like have a discussion or encourage a discussion or at least get people talking about what their um, uh, what their wishes for end of life care are, and along those lines, there's if I remember correctly, the senior center used to have something called the vial of life, which I think the EMTs know about, where they they would list all the important medications. So that if if something happened, if the EMTs came to the, someone's house, they could immediately go and I, I don't know where it's kept, but it's kept in a specific place. And I didn't know if on the again, refrigerator. Is it in the refrigerator? On okay. it, on the refrigerator. On the refrigerator. So I'm just wondering if that, these measures or these discussions or these ideas can be dis are worth discussing in the task force that we have set up and potentially spread widely throughout the town. So I'll just stop there. So, if I may, I don't believe the Vial of Life program is active anymore. It isn't. Oh. It, be it became an issue where um, there were too many the people who are using. They have too many medical changes, and you have to update everything on paper and stick it in the fridge. And with the availability of electronic medical records, it's less of an issue. Um, if I may? Please. Uh, so, Saya, great, great um, comment. I appreciate you including that. And that's the type of thinking that uh, we welcome on the task force. I won't spend the time here talking about the meeting that we had, um, albeit to say that it was a fantastic first kickoff meeting. And I do think that um, these are conversations that we could certainly undertake uh, groups that are part of um, the task force uh, could certainly bring that kind of conversation to those that wanted to participate um, to think about those and, and to have those very difficult conversations or to prepare to have them uh, with loved ones, um, even if just, sorry. <laughs> Dogs barking outside, um, even, even if um, in the just-in-case scenario. Um, we can also talk about a number of kind of related things in terms of, you know, here's a form for healthcare proxy, all those kind of things that, that folks should have nearby um, at this uh, time. So good, good question. I did jot it down for the task force. Good. No, I think it's an appropriate thing for the task force to uh, include or some of those things. And just as a reminder for anybody who might be watching, um, talking about end of life care, um, it's easier to do it when you're healthy and you can do it uh, without the pressure of having somebody, you know, in the hospital. So, um, yeah, take the time now um, while it's, you know, at the forefront of your thought. And, um, you know, I encourage people to discuss it. Um, as far as the, the last thing I have about the, um, the numbers is that I wanted to talk a little bit about the trends that, that we're seeing, um, especially at the um, county and the state level. Um, We've been, over the past um, week, we've been mostly um, averaging for the county about um, a little over 100 new cases a day. And at the state level, um, I think it's been about 1,200 new cases a day. Um, it's been fairly flat and some days higher, some days lower. It's hard to see a trend if it's coming down or going up. But um, we were in a period where it was going up and now it looks a little bit uh, flatter to me. Um, the social distancing that we put in place at the uh, state and the county level really is having an impact. I think if you compare our trends of growth with places that haven't done the social distancing that we have, if you look at like a Louisiana that has, um, you know, still had Mardi Gras and would had barely, you know, come to grips with the fact that social distancing was important, um, we can see that the, the growth in new cases there is much higher than um, in the uh, places like Massachusetts. I do want to say though that Worcester County has um, probably the tied in the is the highest county in Massachusetts as far as our growth rate. Um, so there's still more that we can do in terms of social distancing. Um, but I think at one point we were at like you know 50% increase per day. Uh, it then dropped to 30%, and I think now we're averaging maybe closer to like a 17% increase. So we have brought it down. Um, plenty of other states out there have managed to get their growth rates down to um, 8%, so places like Washington. So I really would like people to realize that the things that we've been doing have had an impact, but there's, there's more that we can still do. So uh, do you have more data you're about to share? Nope, that was it. All right, well, I hate to uh, be a bearer of bad news, but in addition to the number of cases that Nathan has cited, there's also uh, tracking the daily number of deaths in Massachusetts. And that has generally been in the 20 to 30 range 
Um, and unfortunately, they just released numbers this afternoon, and there were 96 deaths in the state of Massachusetts today from COVID-19. It's almost, uh, well, it's more than triple what it was yesterday. And it's by far more than double the highest previous number. So this is a real spike. Uh, the governor has talked about there being perhaps a surge uh, over the time frame from April 10th to 20th. And we are approaching that. And if this is any indicator, it can be a pretty rough spell. And so everything that Nathan said, I think, is uh, something people really need to take to heart. So the question that I have is... Uh, actually, last before week, you go, Clay, I think that um, oh, um, uh, police, or Fire Chief uh, Patrick Purcell um, has just joined and, and wanted to answer the question about um, how EMTs oh. are responding. Are you there, Patrick? Hi. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So uh, the paramedics are not uh, given aerosolized medications in the back of the ambulance right now. If they do need oh, to give something by nebulizer, they okay. are giving it outside of the ambulance while wearing N95 masks, eye protection uh, uh, gowns, and uh, usually a surgical mask over them as well. Great, Chief. Thank you. Great. Is that it? Uh, I think that was all. Yep. But, uh, okay. Nathan, I just had two other. Did you have anything else? Because I had just two other things that I, um, so I would like to get to um, construction parks and yes. curfew, but yes. you have more stuff about the numbers. No, no. Just I wanted to discuss the construction. And, okay, yeah, uh, let's move on to construction then. Um, we had talked last week about, um, you know, what we wanted to do. I think there was a, a little bit of discussion about what was considered essential construction and what was considered non-essential construction. We had a number of places that were actively um, having construction go on. I think that Steve and a few other people had gone out to visit some of the sites. And so maybe Steve, if we can uh, get an update from the relevant people as to where things are now, we can uh, use that to shape our, our decision about what policies we might want to put in place. Sure, so uh, I, I did ask Fred, and Christy asked Fred Leonardo, who's our building commissioner to be on too, and I believe Fred is on. Uh, Fred and Ray went out to uh, a few of the bigger sites uh, after we had spoken on Tuesday to kind of see what was going on. And um, uh, I, I don't know if, uh, if one of them want to chime in on what they saw. And I believe there have been some shutdowns of voluntarily of some sites uh, since then also. Um, Fred, you want me to take it first? This is Ray. Sure. Please. All right. Um, Fred and I did go out to two of the major sites. We were on Otis Street at the Amazon Robotics. And uh, while we were there, they had, they had put a plan together of what they were going to do, how they were going to do it. Uh, they sent a copy to me. I have a copy in the office. Um, and they looked like they were doing all right. They're doing more demo than anything else right now. And like Fred said, under safety regulations, you got to let them complete the demo. Can't have a building half standing or any walls or anything like that. Uh, we also went up to um, Chauncey Lake to the Pulte construction site where they are building housing. Housing is considered essential. So they were out there. They have pictures. Uh, they have, I'm sorry, they have signs in every window of every apartment they're working in on the doors going into the building. They set up hand wash stations. They have, um, they're using the gentlemen who are working in close quarters are using bandanas or something to cover their faces because there are no hospital masks to be found. Um, and that's what we found. Uh, the, I know the, um, and Fred, you can chime in if I'm wrong, but Pulte is not pulling back on construction, but I believe Amazon is. Are you there, Fred? Did you want to comment? Sure. Um, if you can hear me. Uh, I'm on. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear, we can you. hear you, Fred. Okay, great. So this is where we stand with uh, a few different projects. 50 Otis Street, Amazon, uh, I spoke to them Monday. Their field operations individual has said that they've shut that site down. Uh, so at this point in time, they are not operating. I haven't been on to the site, but I'm going by what I've been told. Uh, I can certainly visit the site if uh, if there's a desire to do that. But they said they have uh, stopped all construction. They've been advised, some of the companies have been advised by their council to where they stand on things. They may try to petition the state um, as an essential function, but right now they've shut down. 
moving on um, 800 West Park Drive. We went out there. They're actually uh, winding down as well. They had asked for permission to close up part of their first floor because they they had glazing that was open and the building was open to weather. Uh, I didn't see that being an issue. So on a very limited basis, they're supposed to be closing that project down. They thought it'd be another week or so, so they get it weather tight. Uh, there was a, <clears throat> there's a church addition going on right, right across from Westboro Country Club. I think it's 120 West Main. They had asked, they had started an addition several months ago. So they've had asked to continue just closing that addition up which again, I thought was reasonable to secure the site. Um, Pulte, we just found out today, they're actually losing uh, working members. So albeit there, they can continue. They're having a hard time getting the crews to physically come out and do the work. Uh, so they've actually started to slow down significantly uh, due to the fact they just can't get people out there, but they don't plan on stopping necessarily, but they don't know where they're going to be as far as uh, getting help out there to work. Uh, and then interestingly enough, uh, the corner of Turnpike and Lyman, because there's a ready med there, they've interpreted that to mean that they can consider that essential function and they continue to do construction according to the property owner. So that's where we stand on several different sites. And what about fields, Fred? Have you been to fields, or do you know where we stand with fields by any chance? Um, that's a good question. No, I, I didn't. You know, I kind of, I thought about that, but I didn't get out there. I don't know why. So I can certainly reach out to them and find out where they stand in the process. Because um, when I, but I, I don't Fred, know. Go ahead, Fred. Do you hear me? This is right. I was. Uh, I drove by today. They are working on the outside of the building in. Um, machinery i didn't see anybody else but there was like six machines going today when i drove by around 9 30 this morning yes Saya, this is shelby they are it is all um uh, excavation uh land moving and foundation work and i'll just jump in ray and i were out at silver hollow today on mount pleasant they are doing uh, utility work out there they're working on the septic and looks like running some kind of utilities in the street Minimal people out there, I'd say 10 if that. Yeah, so I think then um, with that, it now comes to the board to kind of start discussing um, any policies we might want to put in place. I think that, um, you know, reiterating that non-essential um, construction um, should stop um, would be one option to consider. The other options that we, we could consider are, um, you know, asking even essential businesses. I think we are... Um, do have if we think that our board um, can't inspect those places properly to ensure that the workplace is safe, that we can actually ask them to stop construction, even if it's essential construction. Um, I think that's not favored by the state. I think the state would prefer that all essential construction go. Um, and I think that we could even decide that um, non essential construction in some cases um, can continue to go if we wanted to as a board. But um, I think those are kind of the options that we have in front of us. So from my perspective, listening to the reports that we just heard, it sounds like most places are either acting appropriately or, uh, you know, doing things to prepare for uh, cessation of work, but doing work that really does need to be done before they can get to that point. So I, I'm not hearing anything that makes me think that there is a problem the board needs to take action on through the form of resolution. Although, well, you know, what about well, something like the ready med that was mentioned, where it sounds like construction is um, ongoing and not going to stop, and it may or may not actually relate to um, you know an essential business. It might just be other property. If we had a policy in place that was clear, it would give guidance to places like that. Um, but I do, we have a lot of responsible parties already in town, and I think they are doing the right thing in terms yep. of securing their site and getting ready for an extended closure. So I will say, for what it's worth, I did not know there was a ReadyMed going in there. And as I am employed by ReadyMed, I will not partake in this particular discussion of that facility. Uh, it's, it's not a ReadyMed. It's a, it's, a, it's a quick clinic, but it's not ReadyMed. Okay, that makes me feel better. <laughs> but yeah, it's convenient MD, I think it's called. Sorry, Nathan, what about yes, Pulte? Um, so 
Pulte is a um, considered housing. And so I think that the state considers it essential, um, essential construction. And so I think as long as, you know, we'd have to make a first a determination that our board would not be able to um, inspect them enough to, you know, make the workplace safe. And that would be the only way that I think we um, would be able to tell them that they have to shut down. Um, but certainly we can put in place practices that they have to have. I think we already have hand wash facilities and all sorts of other restrictions, and they're following all those guidelines. We have certain spacing that we have in place um, requirements around, and it sounds like due to just lack of workforce, they're going to be meeting some of that anyway. Um, okay. So I, I, is, I'm not so worried about that, but, um, you know, I'm certainly open to, you know, if you guys are worried. So I have two questions, and this may be for Christy or for Fred or, or the board. Is it possible to, uh, to get like a report? Uh, and I don't want to generate work, you know, inappropriately for Fred because I know our department is, is stretched. Is it inappropriate to ask just to get a follow up like in a week, like where where uh, people stand? So that's my fir first question. My second question, I guess this is to Shelby, because I think uh, Shelby is part of the uh, school building committee. Yes. Uh, as, as Christy is. The thing is, FAILS is a, um, for want of a better word, is a town project. And so I think as, as a town project, our bar on making sure that the worker safety in that project should be higher, not lower. And I, um, I don't know how to phrase this, but I just want to make sure that you know, in the that we that we should do all that we can to make sure that those workers who are doing who are working for us as a town are not put at risk uh, because of the actions of the town. Can we take these one at a time, Nathan? Yeah, let, let's do. Let's first do um, the essential um, places. Um, this would include uh, Pulte. And I, I think that there might not be any motion required for that because I think we might let them continue to um, do construction. I will say that while we're in this crisis uh, phase of the infection, where the, we potentially are having a significant um, increase in cases and mortality, that I would like a once a week check in with the sites that are open. I don't think it needs to be a fancy report, but just some, I, I would like to know that somebody's assessing the situation so that we can evaluate what we're told in light of new data that we're getting in terms of cases and mortality and things like that. I think that's reasonable. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, uh, this is Ray. Um, I am in email contact with the, um, the uh, person in charge of the site. They had to, um, uh, Fred was there with me. They had to um, name someone as the COVID safety officer on site. Um, I am in direct contact with him once a week, and I will be getting reports from him once a week, emails. I will be stopping by once a week to see how things are going and if there's any issues. That's is that Pulte. for Pulte? Is that, that's for Pulte, right? That, that, that's for Pulte, yes. Is that also true for the other sites? I mean, that, that was very clear in the state's construction guideline. Well, every place that I visited with Fred, they all had guidelines that they were using. Okay. Um, Pulte is the one that I have a, everybody had a on site that we met with, they all had a safety officer, right. but like Fred said, the one at on Otis street is closing down. So that's one I won't have to worry about. I can stop by fails. There's three different companies working at fails right now. One was doing septic. One was doing land. Uh, they were moving land and there was another company on site when I was there. I can check with them and see, make sure they have a policy on site. And if they have a site manager, who is actually the safety manager. Um, but I definitely with I know Syed had asked about Pulte, but I will definitely be working with Pulte uh, one, once a week. Okay. Can I just oh. add one thing, and then maybe I'm wrong here, but Steve, maybe, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but okay. when I had read the essential projects, I saw, I thought that, that um, construction for educational infrastructure was still on the essential list, and I may have misread that, but... It is. It is. It is. It is. So would fails, I would assume the fails would fall under that. Yes. Yeah. So maybe to move things along, if I could just propose, I think we have the manpower to go to these sites between Ray and Fred. I think Fred would help me out. 
So if it's okay with everybody, why don't we just try next, you know, this week and next week to make an inspection and then report back and make yep. sure things are where they need to be. And then what about the workers that failed? How are we, I mean, are we, um, are we just, and yep. I'm perfectly okay with Ray touching base with them. And if they have a safety person that's working with the, with the workers, then, you know, yes, that's I fine. Am. This is Shelby. They, they absolutely, Gilbane is uh, well aware of the state's communications expectations policy around safety specific to COVID-19. Uh, Ray, um, I can connect you with uh, Steve Durrett, chair of the school building committee, okay. and uh, our owner project manager and Gilbane, uh, Gilbane site manager, so that you can make sure you have a direct line of contact uh, for any questions that you have. All right, thank you. Uh, Shelby, just, just to that anecdotally, um, I just went by there this weekend just to look at it, but the entrance gate where Gil Baines, um, you know, they, they had the, the fence all around and locked in. Um, prominently displayed right at their entrance gate is the is all the signs and requirements and the um, temperature testing and all that, but I think Shelby was spot on with um, That's just anecdotal on my part, and it's not, I wasn't there watching the practice, and it was just looking at the post they had on the exterior of the fence, but having our um, inspectors out there, I think would be would be um, a good next step. Good, so I think that with the manpower we have, we keep the essential places going. Um, I think now if we start talking about the non-essential uh, businesses, I think that if we want to as a board have um, maybe a, an entertain a motion where we ask people to stop construction or at least get non-essential construction um, to a secure position, whether it be, you know, weather sealing or finishing the demo um, with the expectation that non-essential construction is going to be stopped for a period of time. Excuse me, Alan, I'm yeah. hearing some feedback from uh, Nathan. Do you know, is, does somebody have their mic on that needs to be turned off or? Yeah, I think if, if everybody could put, if everyone could go on mute, I think typically that's what causes. So if everyone that's not talking can put their microphones on mute while someone else is talking, that should take that background away. So Nathan, I know that you guys are in the process of making a motion. I would like to make a comment or question once there's discussion, please. Yeah, so I hadn't actually made a motion yet. Um, we can still entertain discussion before or after that motion is made. So go ahead, Shelby. Um, so I just, um, I, I'm fully on board with everything that's being discussed, and I think it's great to have a follow-up in a week, uh, particularly because we're in this surge um, time frame that Dr. Ehrlich already referenced. Um, my concern, though, is that that list of essential uh, contractors goes well beyond what we're talking about here. Uh, landscaping, what about independent contractors, someone, I'm making it up, someone that's having the bathroom finished, that could be classified as sanitation, what's the direction? I mean, where, how far are we going here? And then I think it's a fair question to say, should this conversation just be limited to construction? Are there other groups that are individuals that aren't practicing uh, proper social distancing, but construction companies are? I'm just, I'm just concerned. Yeah, so I, I followed the links that you had sent me um, about all of the constructions and how they broke down. I walked away with a very different impression. That there was actually, I thought it was much more limited. The set of stuff that was essential and things like this generalized construction was not considered essential, and that the essential ones were, I thought, laid out um, much clearer than that. So maybe I misread it wrong. I, I walked away thinking that it was pretty clear what. Um, you know, what things were essential. And so things like the Amazon facility, the um, um, the West Park Drive, those, those ones to me looked like they were clearly non-essential. I think the discussion that you had at your last meeting didn't have the benefit of having seen that list because I think the, the new list came out, um, just when the new construction guidelines came out while you were having a meeting or just before. Um, so I think that that's why this conversation is different. But it does say um, in the new list that, that some, you know, laboratories or construction of laboratories is essential, which is one of the things that um, that Fred mentioned that Amazon is applying um, under that essential 
uh, classification. And yeah. so, so the, 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 the guidance that, that I read was laboratories that were doing stuff related to COVID or like immediate healthcare issues. Like if a hospital wanted to build a new wing to house COVID patients, that was supposed to be um, covered. Things like building a new R&D lab to do robotics that are gonna pay off 10 years down the road. To me, that is not included in there, at least the way I read it. Um, so it might be a little bit of interpretation, but it, to me, it, you know, something that's a R&D lab that, that has nothing to do with COVID-19 does not seem like a, an essential function right now. Um, do we have, I mean, certainly hearing other people talk to you, I don't know if Alan, if, I had, if you've looked at any of these essential lists or... So, I did look at it, but um, yeah, I see we're getting comments about ongoing feedback, which I've certainly been hearing. So, again, if uh, I'll talk for like maybe a minute and a half, so everyone else can just mute for a second. Um, so, what what I think is that the list is good guidance and i read it over and i didn't give a lot of precise thinking to is this project in or is this project out i think from what i heard earlier today uh, this evening at the meeting most uh, there seems to be good alignment between what the businesses are doing and uh what we would normally expect and i really think that the uh the issue of anything that would be of concern is what was raised about what's happening in less formal construction facilities. So for instance, if I want to renovate my bathroom or I'm going to renovate my kitchen or things like that, typically you need to have a building permit before you do that. And I didn't know if we have a moratorium on building permits or under what circumstances we are granting them right now, but you know that's where you have workers coming in to someone's home. Um, and yes, people, from what I hear anecdotally, uh, you know, People are doing it in a way to minimize uh, social uh, interactions, but nonetheless, that's the direction, if anything, that I think there may be uh, room for improvement as opposed to the more formal construction sites that are visible and we can monitor and you know we can assess on a case-by-case -case basis whether we think something is inappropriate. But Ehrlich, once again, you've taken my breath away but with your extensive analysis. I actually... Um, I agree with you. The, my question, to, and I think the, the the point to kind of take off from that is the point of control. And again, not to throw Fred under the bus or anything. The point of control is through the building department. And if we can partner, again, not to generate work for Fred, but if we can partner with the building department as with, and with the board of health, we can keep a track. And you know, I trust Fred's judgment. I trust our board of health. If, they, if we can work together, I think we have we have a pretty the approach that Fred and Ray have already discussed has been it was exhaustive it was complete it answered a lot of my concerns if we can find a process of monitoring this construction or working through the building department I think we could have a way forward without having a um, without having a uh, you know motion does that make sense. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that one option is to not make a, a motion or put up any moratorium on the larger places. I think that's sounding like what the consensus of the, the board is going to be. Um, but, but routing and, those through Fred or the building department or whatever that, you know, yeah. that, because that's, and I didn't know if Fred or Christy had anything to comment on that. Would that work? Is that extra work? Not possible, not doable. I didn't know what you, you guys were thinking. Yeah. I, I am not sure what you're proposing. So, I, I think all Fayette is asking is whether the um, building department can keep the Board of Health informed of ongoing projects. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think they work together anyway. So. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I don't see any problem with that. We are, uh, like you said, we, we communicate on a daily basis, if not multiple times a day. So I don't see a problem with that. And so now to um, Alan Ehrlich's um, comments about uh, kind of home improvement projects and that type of construction. Certainly there is the smaller projects where, you know, someone goes and buys some paint and, you know, it's just painting their, their house. They're doing small, small work that may or may not even need a, a building permit. 
And then there's obviously the larger stuff where they're hiring an electrician to do work. Some of it is um, safety. You know, if you've got a leak in your roof and you have to have someone out and, and fix it, that stuff has to happen. Um, for other projects where it might just be a convenient time because you're home, um, we have to decide whether that's appropriate. And I think that's where you were headed out. Yeah, so I have no objection to people doing self-improvement, uh, home improvement projects themselves. But if you're talking about things where you need to bring in a plumber or you need to bring in an electrician, um, that's where I'm thinking that there may be issues. And um, those types of projects really should be where, as you say, there's something more essential going on. Maybe there's a leak uh, or there's something that creates uh, a health or habitation concern. Yeah, it's going to be a little tricky to distinguish between those two, I think. Um, and we can probably do an advisory where we advise people not to do non-essential home improvement projects that require other people coming into the household. But it's going to be really difficult for us to determine what is essential and what isn't. If someone's renovating their bathroom versus fixing a, a toilet that doesn't work or bringing one up to condition so that someone can isolate, we don't want to stop the project that is really important for stopping the spread of COVID, but at the same time, separating that from the people that are just doing a renovation project. Yeah, so I'm not looking for something formal in that regard, but again, you know, when people come into the building department and they're look, get, trying to get a building permit, I, I assume there's a general, you know, uh, a constructive conversation about, well, what's the project and, you know, what what's needed for it and things like that. Um, and so I'm just saying as part of that conversation, maybe tonight's discussion can help uh, inform how that conversation goes. I like that idea. Um, Fred, uh, does that sound reasonable to, to you? Are you the one that handles building permits or is that somebody else? <laughs> well, they're all up channels through my, to the office, the building department office, but we're an online permitting service. So, uh, albeit a lot of the permits have slowed down appreciably from what we were, but permits are still rolling in. So we approve them uh, for the most part without seeing our customer base. So they just come in, whether it be plumbing, electrical, building permits, uh, and they get approved through the system. Uh, we don't generally have direct contact either by phone or, or otherwise with the customer. And we don't really, I don't want to say grill them, but we don't get into the specifics of the job. We just, we, if it's a building permit, we look at the plans, if there's questions that inspectors reach out to them, uh, and we kind of take it from there, case by case, case stuff that way. But again, all our stuff is done electronically. So uh, I, I'd have to know what you're asking me to do, I suppose. Um, so what we put into place is we've separated the. Go ahead. Yeah, I was unaware that it was uh, on, uh, on an online thing. So uh, I thought people still came into the office. That just shows how long it's been since I've had to do this. Well, we haven't had physical contact with our customer base uh, for two to three weeks. That doesn't mean we don't have any contact. People still can call us a couple of days a week and drop off stuff, and we meet them. Uh, but for the most part, nobody's coming into the office to do any of that anymore. Yeah, so I think that what we're looking for is trying to find some way that we can help encourage people that are just looking to do a reno renovation project to have them not do it uh, at this point in time. And and just to try to dissuade them from for safety purposes that just the more interaction you have with other people, the more likely you are to either pick up a disease or spread the disease to one of these workers. And we realize that, you know, electricians and plumbers are, you know, essential people right now to keep the, the whole system working. We, we want to keep them healthy. We don't want them going to places they don't have to and get sick from um, somebody um, just because they, they can. Um, and so we're trying to figure out where we can put some of those things in place to kind of slow um, the process down. So, so maybe, Nathan, maybe the best thing is simply um, if it's possible on the site where people go to uh, request a permit, that there be some kind of advisory uh, up just warning people along the lines of what we're saying. Um, I don't know if that's that? yeah, a big great. problem or if that'd be easy to do. Uh, maybe Christy knows the answer to that. Are you are you proposing that um, that Fred just work with each person to see? Uh, no. 
Sorry. I, I'm proposing that we just put something on the website where you uh, where you would file your application that basically says attention during this COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic, non-essential um, construction projects involving bringing uh, workers into individual homes uh, is discouraged or something yeah, to that effect. I think that's fine. That's easy to do. That we could definitely do. Okay, I'd be on board with that. Um, Syed, do you think we need to go any further? Yeah, I think that's a great. Uh, yeah, Alan, I think that's a great idea. I think this is. Uh, I think a lot of other businesses have kind of like this flyer that comes up, like we're it's COVID nineteen. We're not going to. So I think this is great, great idea. Okay. Anything else we need to do with construction related topics? Hearing nothing, um, I'd like to move on to uh, talking a bit about the, the parks in town. I know that. Um, some communities uh, have closed their parks, and um, I want to bring it up for discussion as to whether Westboro should be doing the same thing, or whether we, we think that the people here in Westboro are not congregating in parks. Well, as a frequent user of the park, I guess I should make, make my um, uh, conflict of interest clear. I mean, I think the, what I've seen, and I've gone almost everywhere, uh, people are keeping social distancing. And I think being outdoors now more than ever, people are walk, walking individually, more people than not are, at least the people that I've seen are walking with responsibility. I think it's important to get out and be out. I think it's um, certainly, again, speaking for myself, I, I'm, I would go stir crazy if I had to just be stuck in my home. Nathan, may I? Uh, go ahead. Hi. Um, Tim and I walk down to the high school almost every day, and we go around the track mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing is very few people, maybe 12 at the most, but they aren't together. Mm -hmm. I see everybody far apart, mm -hmm. like maybe two kids playing lacrosse, and they're about 12 feet apart. Mm -hmm. I see single people jogging around. They all seem to be very healthy teenagers. But being very good about the social distancing, and I haven't ever seen, I think, more than 12 people at a time down there on the high school. So I think that's a really nice place for people to be able to go and it seems safe now. I also see parents every once in a while on the brook, on the side of the brook with like a toddler or something, just sitting on the grass uh, overlooking the brook. So that's one place I'm noticing and I feel like people are being very good there. Yeah, uh, so I've, I've been to the track too. I've seen similar things with you. The uh, places that I haven't been because I don't have any little kids are places like the school playground or um, you know the, the little kid parks in town. Um, obviously, those places um, I'm worried about, but I just have no insight into um, you know how they're being used right now. We already closed the playground. Yeah, the playgrounds are closed. Yeah. yeah, the playgrounds are kicked off. Um, and anecdotally, as I drive by that, which um, out and about enough to see them. I'm not seeing anyone even just on the play surface. And, and does anybody know anything about like maybe the, um, the dog parks or places like, um, you know, the Freedom Park? Those trails are pretty actively used as I understand it. Um, and, you know, that where it connects over by Milk Pond and, and Andrews, um, actively being used by lots of different people. I can't yeah, we don't, we don't officially have any dog specific dog parks in town. We have we have leash laws and, and responsibilities of dog owners, but there is no specific um, dog parks per se in town. Not yet. Dog park at we're, we're getting we're getting them soon enough. <laughs> so uh, I would just uh, say that uh, first of all, I, I go at different times to the track, obviously, than uh, Selectman Emery because. First of all, I go jogging there, and I'm not anything you would call a young person. And uh, But I do agree with most of her assessments that people space, and even to the point of as you're passing people on the track, people are several lanes apart and things like that. So for the most part, I find that's pretty responsible. If I see people you know, not practicing social distancing at all, for the most part, I see them walking on the sidewalks of Westboro. It's not in these parks. So clusters of four or five or six uh, youths at a time will go walking together, which, okay, I'm not saying they, you know, maybe they're all related, I don't know, but they seem close in age. In any event, the point is, I don't think the parks are a unique source of 
uh, problem, at least as best as I can tell. I have not spent a lot of time at the parks. I drive around, though, from, you know, for whatever reason uh, that I need to be out and about. And like I said, I see more issues just people walking on the sidewalks than I do uh, in more formal settings such as the high school. Yeah, this probably doesn't apply to us too much. I think it was mostly the places that had some sort of attraction, like a beach or something like that, where they had large numbers of people coming, especially from out of town. And so they were closing either the park itself or the, the parking at the um, at the parks. Um, but no, I, I think that probably it sounds like we, we don't want to take any action on, on this. I know. I think it was great that you brought it up, but I don't think right now we need to take any action. I think we can just um, slide for now. So the last I, item I on the list of things to consider was um, a, a curfew, and mostly it was just to bring it up to say that we don't necessarily need to implement one, but um, to give you guys the chance that if you thought we did, the, the chance to explain why you thought it, we might need one. But you know, I think like places like Boston have one where at night they don't want people out. I frankly feel like if people want to go for a run um, later in the evening or, or go out. I mean, if anything, it just spreads out social distancing. So I, I don't necessarily have a problem with people being out. I'll say half jokingly that people uh, ask whether we already have a curfew in Westbrook because they say the sidewalks roll up by <laughs> Yeah, <minutes>. right. <laughs> Which is okay. <laughs> yep. So I, I agree with you, Nathan. I don't see the need for any action. Excellent. So I'm um, saying you said you had a couple items i think i'm all yeah, going just, one, uh, just just to wrap it up uh sorry uh, i just wanted to f circle back with something steve um you know the uh the governor has put out the uh, or had mentioned something about the uh working with partners in health to have a tracking mechanism for contact is that going to a be in our town is it going to work with you supersede you do you know how that's going to work yeah we were uh so so we got some very good news uh, on Friday that uh, DPH is partnering with a lot of the schools of public health, their students to help us with uh, contact tracing. We've applied to be part of that program. Uh, I got an email message today saying that someone will be reaching out to me shortly. So that will be very helpful as far as if we get a big influx of cases uh, to have some help in tr tracking, you know, the contacts and that sort of thing. So uh, I've been very lucky right now with the staff. It's been great. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, say thank you to Judy Nguyen, who is the, one of the head school nurses who is helping me. Um, but, you know, when this contract contact tracing comes online, it will surely help us out a lot. Okay, great. Thank you, Steve. Um, I, and, if, I guess, and if people have concerns, they can always reach out to you to discuss further, right, Steve? Yes. Yeah, I'm in the office, so just give yep. me a call. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, I think the one other thing that came up today at the um, State Department of Health call that I was on was that um, there are a number of um, new tests that are out on the market, and I guess especially some from overseas. And they just wanted to put out a warning and make sure that if you are buying any sort of test, that make sure it's uh, FDA um, approved. And that if you don't get a test that's not, you know, if you have one that's not FDA approved, then that means that they might not have done a lot of the validation trials on it. So um, just for the public out there, be aware that um, the FDA does help regulate tests and that people are selling things that might not be regulated. Do you mean like over the counter? Was it implied to compare the addresses? Yes, like there are. There are people that are selling over the counter or do it yourself, take home, you know, type of tests. And um, I think especially there's an increase in interest in like antibody based testing. And the antibody based testing is not considered the gold standard. The gold standard is still the PCR based tests. And so, um, a little bit of buyer beware if you're actually going out and trying to purchase your own test. And Nathan, thank you for bringing that up too, because I do think it, it has been out there through law enforcement and whatnot that there are a number of, unfortunately, in these times, there are um, people that are out there looking to scam people um, and individuals. So I just ask that the public folks that are watching and stuff out there to, to, to heed that, that you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. Um, people coming door to door and offering to test or whatever, don't trust them. Um, you know, ask questions, feel free to call 
uh, whether it's the state or whether it's the, the town. Not that I want the um, you know Steve to get inundated here, but um, unfortunately, we do have folks that will um, use this as an opportunity to pray. Mm -hmm. and just you know, just encourage folks in town to be diligent and uh, and uh, you know to, to basically you know ask the questions if it doesn't seem right. You say no. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, there's more than just uh, fake tests out there. There's a lot of scams going on. Um, and I do think anything COVID-19 related, whether you were to you know, think it might be a scam or anything else, there is a state uh, number 211 that you can call and ask questions. And so um, that might also be a great resource to call into to ask um, you know, whether something is real or valid or should be followed. I just wanted to clarify, when you were using the phrase over the counter, really the danger is over the internet. Yes, that's what I meant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anything else, Dr. Ehrlich? Yes. Uh, one other thing. Uh, you know, we are so caught up with everything COVID-19 that we do need to have normal Board of Health business taken care of as well. And I didn't know if we were still planning on doing that at next week's meeting, uh, which would be our usually scheduled monthly meeting. Well, I have the next meeting for the 21st. Um, is that still what we want to do? Uh, I'm sorry. I got confused about my weeks. Yes, the 21st is, the is in fact, when I was expecting it. Yep. So we'll, we'll set something up just for the board and for our office to do it. I'll send an agenda, like usually with a packet and all that stuff. Okay. Sorry, Nathan, do, is, um, can I still ask for something? Um, say yep. Me. yep, we haven't closed the meeting yet. Uh, and this is just, uh, I brought this up, um, and this is basically for the task force that's looking at the town's response. One, I I, I, um, I discussed, are there any protections, and this is just for Shelby and Christy to take to the task forces. One, are there any, things, any protections that we can uh, put on, uh, like, as a town for, as, for moratoriums on, uh, on evictions and foreclosures? That's one. And then I just want to make sure that we as a town have a pro policy or a process to provide uh, quarantine lodging in case people need it. I recognize, so I just raised those points uh, just so that you guys can discuss them for, for consideration. So I, I just want to clarify something about the task force. So the task force is um, looking at you know, certainly all things COVID related, but its purpose is really about residential relief and, and making sure that we're putting programs in place and um, potentially, um, you know, monetary uh, funds in place to be able to provide that residential relief. So in terms of the town response, um, that's what's happening at these meetings um, and then also at the board of meetings um, in terms of operation. So um, I know that you had brought up the quarantine um, locations earlier. I know the governor talked about that today. Um, and so that's something that you and I started talking about uh, this morning. I think your addition of the uh, quarantine uh, resource is a good one. I've noted that. Thank you. So with that, I think I'd like to uh, entertain a motion that we uh, close the meeting. Unless so moved. Oh, nope, actually, I think there's some discussions. Shelby, you got something? To well, I just, I, I think that um, as we shared the numbers, I, I don't want to gloss over the fact I, I also don't, sadly, I don't want to call attention to it, but we did lose someone in town um, uh, to be unnamed. I certainly don't know who that person is, um, but I think it would be appropriate for uh, both boards at least to acknowledge um, uh, certainly the passing of that person. Um, maybe just for a brief moment of silence, if we could. Um, and uh, sadly, I'm sure that won't be the first one, but I do think we should acknowledge that. Thank you, Shelby. We can take that moment now if you'd like. Okay, so now back to the motion on the table, and that's to um, end this meeting. Uh, I do think that, um, as Shelby said, that it is probably the first of several, hopefully uh, not tons of people that, that do end up uh, passing away. This is a, a very serious illness. Um, and we will be having our meeting every Tuesday um, 
for the foreseeable future while this is uh, going on as far as the Board of Health. Um, we're welcome to entertain the Board of Selectmen joining in. Do you guys want to uh, close out your meeting at the same time or are you guys going to continue after we're done? What, what's your plan, Ian? No, we're going to close out at the same time. Just one thing to note, we'll work on this. So we have our regularly scheduled uh, board meeting for next um, Tuesday. So we have a number of things that we need to handle um, as, as regular business. So we'll just coordinate as to appropriate timing for this joint meeting, um, knowing that we'll have um, additional meeting. And it sounds like you will have that on the 21st. So we'll just yeah, I think we're going to have an extended meeting on the 21st. Yeah, um, where we okay. go through a lot of the, the boring uh, stuff um, that's non COVID-19 related. Yeah, we'll be doing the same. We'll be doing the same thing on the 14th with the stuff that's I don't call it boring. Some of us, you know, uh, <laughs> I just want to say that uh, I have found these meetings to be very constructive that we've held jointly. Uh, I do find the perspective of the Board of Selectmen bring on many of the issues that come before us to be uh, very informative. And I hope, uh, you know, we too inform issues that come before you in a, in a constructive way. Absolutely. Yes, I'm getting more, more and more impressed with your capabilities as I watch you work together. And I wanna thank Alan for facilitating all this so nicely. Yes, thank you. And Westboro TV as well for the work to, to broadcast this. So much appreciated. All around good team here. Thank you guys. Um, Slade, can we, we get a second for uh, Alan's motion? All right, Ted Hashmi, I, I second the motion. Okay, all in favor? Um, Walsh, aye. Um, Dr. Ehrlich? Aye. Um, Dr. Hashmi? Yes. Okay, same thing on the Board of Selectmen. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. I, I second, second it. Okay, motion seconded. Uh, Selectman Edinburgh, roll call. Edinburgh, yes. Selectman Marshall? Yes. Selectman Emery? Yes. Selectman Hashmi? Yes. And Selectman Johnson? Yes. So we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.